Hi, my name is Myra Maravilla. I'm currently the councilwoman in the city of Hawaiian Gardens, and I also work for the city of Long Beach. Great, great. So the first thing I like to do when I have my guests is I like them to start off from the beginning with their story. What was, uh, you know, life growing up? Did you grow up with siblings? Uh, what was K-12 like? Yeah, sure. So I went to first an elementary school, which is a local elementary school in Hawaiian Gardens. I'm a middle child. I have an older sister and two younger siblings. Uh, my parents both uh, migrated here to the U.S. from Mexico when they were young adults. Um, and so I have a very close tie to my family's heritage of uh, being Mexican-American, a Latina. Um, you know, my parents really focused on education. They really valued um, what America had to offer to us. And so I did the best that I could. Um, so growing up, uh, my dad worked. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. And eventually I transferred over to Whitney High School, which is in Cerritos. It's a, a seventh grade to 12th grade um, I guess high school, so it's I didn't really have a junior high experience, but what was that like with the whole age differences like that? Well, it was a bit intimidating. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, but Ferguson Elementary School in Hawaiian Gardens is primarily Hispanic, uh, Latino, and going to a school in Cerritos now meant that a lot of the people in my classrooms didn't quite look like me. We had predominantly Asian uh, population. Um, so it took some adjusting. And for sure, academically, I feel like I was very much behind. A lot of my peers had SAT prep classes. Um, they just had um, other advantages that unfortunately I did not have. Um, but I survived and I eventually graduated in 2006. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I see that uh, there's some people tuning in on you now. I'm about to start a Periscope. We have, of course, the camcorders right here in the two different sides. You know, last time you were on the show, you know, um, it was in a different uh, college and I, you know, we didn't have nearly as great of technology. You know, this one's so much bigger. <laughs> um, it is, and you're doing a great job. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Um, so going back to uh, you know um, K twelve and stuff, um, were you um, like more like shy, um, or were you always you know energetic to like you know speak in public, or did somebody like encourage you to be more outgoing, or how did it go? It's funny that you asked that because when I was in elementary school, I remember my fifth grade teacher um, had pulled me aside and said, "Hey, Myra." Um, ASB or I don't know student council um, they're going to have elections pretty soon and we think you should run and I was like me why me like I felt like I was getting punished for, for being like a smart kid you know and I was just like well you know I don't know and he was just like you know you really need to do it um, when it was all said and done I didn't do it because you know all these kids got like all these crazy posters made out like staples and um, they made pins and just really cool neat things to you know advertise themselves and I thought to myself you know I'm just a nerdy kid in elementary school I for sure I'm not the popular kid and and so I didn't even try um, that was a little bit disappointing that I didn't do it then but that teacher planted a seed um, when I was over at Whitney High School I went from being the smartest kid in school to not the top performer. Um, again, I didn't have a lot of the advantages my other classmates had, um, but I did end up joining MUN, uh, so that's Model United Nations, and I was actually pretty good. Um, I ended up getting a lot of the, the better countries, for those of you who know MUN, and uh, I actually got some awards, uh, so, I thought that that was an indicator that perhaps I would be okay uh, public speaking, um, debating, that sort of thing. And that just kind of spiraled into my young adulthood yeah. in my, um, my relationship with the union over in Hawaiian Gardens when I was working there. Cool. So for those who aren't familiar with, uh, with MUN, like, um, how, how does it work like, compared to like, speech and debate class? It's very similar. It is sort of like a speech and debate class, but it's a club. Um, so everyone sort of represents a country, kind of like the United Nations. Uh, and sort of, it's sort of modeled after that. And so you represent a country and 
one of the top veto countries would indicate that you're a better um, speaker and debater within your group, uh, and then you go and debate with other other schools. So it's it's a very neat experience. It's kind of like nerdy conferences, <laughs> but I enjoyed it, and uh, and I know a lot of my classmates did too. Definitely exposed me to to different opportunities. We'll be right back after this quick break. So that 71% of students at Long Beach State received financial aid. In 2016, Long Beach State awarded 12.3 million in scholarships. Not only that, each year more than 1,500 students are served by disabled student services, leaving no barriers in their path to an education. At the beach, we know no barriers. It's a philosophy that applies to everything we do. Looking for ways to make a little extra Ooh, cash? A Organize a recycling team in your neighborhood oh, where you can go around and collect recyclables and bring them over to the CSUOB ASI Recycling Center where they will pay you for your recyclable items. Our award-winning state-certified recycling facility saves on fun? average the energy to power TV for 55 <laughs> years, as well as 7,400 gallons of gasoline, 213,000 gallons of water, and 520 trees. It's a win-win situation. So gather up your recyclables today and turn them in for that chunk of change that will allow you to splurge enough to turn that burger and do a combo. For more information and offering hours, email them at asi-recycling at csuob.edu. Would you and your friend like to travel around the world for $22? 22 West. 22 for 22 West is our fundraising campaign this year. In order to reduce the amount of student fees requested each year, we are asking for $22 for 22 West from our listeners, viewers, readers, and supporters like you. Each $22 donated between April 21st through May 25th, 2018 will receive one entry into the opportunity drawing for a trip for two anywhere around the world that Turkish Airlines flies. For 10 times that, you'll receive 12 entries, 307 destinations. All proceeds will go directly to equipment, operating expenses, which are put into service training our volunteers, serving our talented student hosts, producers, editors, writers, and on-screen talent. We provide more than three dozen student jobs running our radio, video, magazine operations. We provide 24 internships, a semester to provide a student's hands-on experience in professional media production environment without leaving campus. It's only $22 to provide and possibly also receive an opportunity of a lifetime. Donate securely online at www.22westmedia.com. Do it now. Okay, and we are back here on the Golden Spotlight. Now, I'm back here with my guest and uh, uh, continuing, uh, you were mentioning about um, uh, model United Nations. How, how long did you uh, do that? I did that only for about a year, so just one academic year, and then I moved on to other other cool things. Cool, cool. What was next? Well, in high school, uh, I actually did varsity softball, which doesn't mean a lot <laughs> when it, um, when I w was an adult. Now graduated uh, from high school, I joined a softball league, and I told everyone I was like, I was on the varsity softball team. Um, and everyone's like, oh, you're going to be so good. Everyone on my team was, like, elderly, um, and I was the worst. <laughs> I would strike out. So um, not all of the athletic programs at my high school were the best, but I did it. I, I played sports, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Cool, cool. And uh, from uh, the sports, um how difficult is it as far as like uh, balancing, you know, school work and, and being in the sport? It was very difficult uh, simply because of practice times and we practice off site at Cerritos Regional Park. Um, but, you know, I tried my best to maintain a, a good schedule and stay on top of my schoolwork. I also had a job. My first job was Colstone 
uh, Creamery, which is actually still up and running on South and Curly across from the mall in Cerritos. Um, so that was that was interesting and unique. I'm sure a lot of uh, young college students have to manage uh, work and, and school, and so I always tell everyone just one task at a time. Now that I received my master's in public administration, um, it's just, that's just how you have to do it. One test at a time, one task at a time, one hour of studying at a time um, before you get to the big goals. Most would say that senior year of high school is the most stressful. What was it like for you? Uh, it was it was stressful, but it was a sigh of relief. <laughs> Whitney High School is very competitive academically, and it was uh, challenging, um, to say the least. I always, you know, struggled with getting A's and you know passing my classes. Uh, again, you know, I felt like I never really caught up. Um, I had to walk to the bus stop from my house at 5.45 in the morning to be there by 6, 6.10. The bus would pick me up super early in the morning, um, take me to school, drop me off an hour before class even started. Uh, so I was constantly exhausted. Um, again, I had to wait an hour to get home after school uh, because I took the bus. My parents you know, didn't have the ability to drop me off and pick me up like a lot of my classmates. Um, so that posed a challenge, but you know, I just kind of got through it. My parents never really gave me the option to quit. You know, a lot of students, being a Latina, <laughs> it was uh, interesting to see in seventh grade how maybe there were 20 lat other Latinos with me, and then by the time senior year of high school rolled around, there was maybe five of us graduating together. People either got kicked out because their grades weren't high enough, or um, they decided it wasn't for them, but but it was interesting, and I'm still. That's probably one of my proudest academic achievements, having gone to that school, um, and and just gotten my di my diploma from there. So as uh, senior wraps up, uh, senior year, um, people ask themselves, you know, what's next? What's after high school? What was it for you? For me, um, I actually had gotten accepted here to Cal State Long Beach, Fullerton, LA and a couple of others that I had applied to, but you know, I didn't really have a lot of direction. My, my older sister had gone straight to Cypress College, and you know, she told me, you know, go to a, you know, a two-year college. It, it's just the cheapest. Um, you won't have to pay too much money and take out um, loans. So I went to Long Beach City College. I did three years there, um, and then I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, um, got my BA, then eventually got my MPA <laughs> this last year. So like when you started at the first school, um, what was the transition like? Uh, as, and then you know the differences between like the different systems. Between like high school and college? Yeah. It was so easy. <laughs> I just, I'm so grateful to how rigorous Whitney High School was because when I went to Long Beach City College, I was like, what? I only have to attend class twice a week, and I only have to do like two big papers and just miscellaneous assignments. That's it. <laughs> so um, I was super psyched about it. Um, I was able to develop as an employee when I worked in Hawaiian Gardens, and that was super neat. Um, I, I was a rec leader, actually, and I ran an after-school program. So while I was, you know, just getting my feet wet with college, um, I became a shop steward for Ask Me Local 3624, where I represented my coworkers whenever they had any grievances with management. Ooh, cool. Um, what happened afterwards? Well, uh, shortly after I, you know, continued working through um, college, went to Cal State, um, you know, Fullerton, eventually transferred, I started working for um, the city of Long Beach. Uh, so I actually took a pay cut in Hawaiian Gardens to take on an internship uh, as an intern in the city clerk's office. That was, that was very exciting, very cool. Um, and then eventually I worked for Long Beach City College. So that was, that was again, me, you know, it's like a full circle. You go to school somewhere and I just love my professors. I love the environment. I got to work there for the Academic Senate and the Curriculum Committees. Um, 
And so yeah, I just kind of like worked my way there and became a planning commissioner for Hawaiian Gardens. And then that transitioned my role into running for city council. Ooh, cool. So um, being at the university level and uh, you know the differences as far as even just campus-wise, the population, um, so many students, the ratio of like, you know, I think a certain amount of students per teacher, but one-on-one -on -one time versus high school and stuff. What was that like? In terms of like how much attention I got from my professors? Um, you know, depends. Just some of my classes were just lecture halls with 200 students. I mean, I, maybe it wasn't that many, but it really felt like it. Um, and some of my other classes, especially in my MPA program, we had like maybe 20 students, 22 students um, for a teacher. So that wasn't too bad. Um, I always made the most of it, so I, I enjoyed my educational experiences. So some people, they, they like change their minds and, you know, it, it, chances are, you know, people have a change of heart of what career they want, uh, you know, if it's the idea of it, um, like it, it's okay if you like change your mind here and there or you're still like maybe experimenting with what kind of field you want. How, did you know right away what was going to be your major? So I did, kind of. When I first started, I, I was always, I was actually very artsy, I loved music. Um, I was a concert goer. I followed like System of a Down, you know, touring. I just loved it. I had pink hair. It was just so much fun. And when I started college, I remember that I wanted to study architecture. I felt like that was a very good balance between design and, you know, just like a more serious career. But when I started working in Hawaiian Gardens, you know, they, they actually offered tuition reimbursement to employees who saw a career in government. And so that kind of pivoted my attention away from architecture and into public administration. And so now that I look back, I actually just spoke to some students over um, at a conference and I, and I told them all like, whatever your first gut instinct is, just kind of go with it. And you can always get a master's in something different. You don't have to get the same degree for undergrad as you do for you know, your um, graduate studies. So have fun. If you want to do something interesting, even if your parents may not necessarily approve, just kind of go with it. I mean, half the time we don't end up working in the field that we studied, right? Um, so that's why I say, you know, you're, we spend so much time in school, that's, I feel like that's not even, it's not even about learning a hard subject. I feel like education really is an opportunity for us to delve into different subjects, um, expand our way of thinking, and just analyzing everything we see and hear on TV, and um, being more critical as citizens of the United States and our country. Um, so, you know, have fun with it learn to be a better you <laughs> in any any career you choose. Um, going back to the colored hair, <laughs> uh, tell us about the stories of the colored hair. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I had so much fun, um, me and my friends. So a lot of my, my friends were from our teacher high school. It's like a public school. Um, that's actually my home school where I would have gone to if I hadn't gone to Whitney. Um, and we used to buy concert tickets and that was like back in the day when you actually had to show up to a Ticketmaster and um, we would do that and buy tickets pre-sale and just kind of like hang out in Hollywood all day until the you know the concert started we wanted to be the first people in line and it was it was really fun I had a lot of friends who were musicians and it was a very fun experience wouldn't change it for the world but this is like what I tell everyone. You know, you can have fun and still do your job and do it well. Again, when I when I did when I was going through these experiences and I was, you know, super involved with like, you know, just music and being in that scene, you know, I was still moving up the ladder over in Hawaiian Gardens. I was still taken very seriously. My employer um, gave me a lot of responsibilities. My union brothers and sisters, you know, made me a shop steward where I had to defend a lot of my coworkers. There I was, an 18, 19 year old, 
defending my coworkers who've been there for 10, 15 years against managers um, who might have, you know, violated a contract agreement. So, you know, you don't have to box yourself into one bubble. I think you can be a lot of versions of yourself. You don't have to settle for one specific role. Um, there's always room to grow and we're always evolving. So enjoy the phase that you're in because as you transition, you're gonna, you're gonna have to enjoy that too, right? <laughs> um, so you mentioned uh, the bands and stuff and uh, um, do you still get the, t the chance to like go to like uh, concerts and stuff? Yeah. So I actually, a couple of, like, maybe three weeks ago, I actually got tickets to see System of a Down in uh, San Diego this fall. So I'm super excited. I'm um, taking my, my boyfriend. So he's never been to any uh, <laughs> type of concert but um, of that, you know, genre. But I'm, I'm very excited to go back now that I'm, like, 30 and <laughs> doing other things. <laughs> have you played some of the music for him? Uh, um, yes, I have. And of course, he's like, what's this? I don't understand. Like, why would anyone listen to this? <laughs> but I like it. I used to listen to like Slipknot, I'm a God, all that stuff, Korn. Um, so to me, it's just, it's exciting to share a part of my youth with um, somebody I'm dating. What about um, the moments where like the like the rock songs were like, um, you can't hear the lyrics as clear. Like if somebody has never heard of rock and they, right. they hear those uh, parts of the lyrics of the songs. <laughs> so like, what do you mean? <laughs> like I think I think corn isn't there parts where they're like going like Whoa, like, yeah. like 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 the reaction. <laughs> did you play something like that? What did you say? <laughs> well. He loves me so much that he just kind of looks and smiles and he's just like, I can't, I can't wait to experience this with you. You know, I obviously try to enjoy jazz and gospel and all the unique uh, music that he listens to. So I, I really look forward to sharing that part of myself. Cool, cool. Um, so, uh, okay, we still got time. What? Maybe I'll just take the break, that way we can continue. Students, I'm Sienna Acevedo with your recycling tip update. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't forget the second break. Yeah. You can save around $75 per year by collecting and recycling your own beverage containers. This dollar amount would, of course, be higher if we kids got together with your roommates and cleaned up after all those wild parties. Upwards of $75. Think of all the other things I could buy. Remember, mind your trash and take the time out to bring your cans to the CSULB recycling facilities today. Tired of the same old thing? At Subway, you can try a different sub sandwich every day with the Subway Sub of the Day Meal Deal. Visit Subway in the USU today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Golden Spotlight. I'm your host, Rob Flores, and we are here at 22 West Radio, located at Cal State Long Beach. And I'm back here with my guest. And uh, we're continuing now with, uh, okay, so you mentioned um, um, Fullerton. And um, so tell us about, like, as you got like each degree like the decision that went into like the emphasis and stuff that the yeah. degrees yeah so um, once I got my bachelor's um, I decided you know I really enjoy working for government and I ended up doing an emphasis in urban management I felt like that was kind of a happy medium since I didn't quite do architecture <laughs> I was still able to get um, a little bit more knowledge about that um, which in fact has just been really handy especially because as a councilwoman, um, I just took part in hiring our city manager and our city attorney um, not that long ago, a, you know, a little over a year ago. Uh, so they're both relatively new to Hawaiian Gardens and just, you know, being able to ask questions about, you know, the future development of Hawaiian Gardens, um, their experiences in working with unions, um, 
you know, their management styles, just different different um, aspects of working in upper ma management and government. So, you know, ultimately I feel like um, I'm very pleased that I ended up getting that degree. Uh, it really helps me just analyze things better, ask the right questions, especially, you know, being the youngest uh, councilwoman um, now sitting with my colleagues, I do bring a different perspective. So I always tell people, you know, if you're young and you're just interested, apply. What's the worst that can happen? People don't vote for you or people say no. It's okay, you put yourself out there. Um, so just follow your dreams, whatever they are. Um, and if you're passionate, people will see that. <laughs> tell us about the importance of being bilingual. Well, it certainly helps me communicate and I feel like I don't know, do you speak Spanish? Basic. A basic Spanish? <laughs> or like my cousin says, coconut. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that I feel like you can say in Spanish that you can't really say in English. Like you, there's no direct translation for certain words or certain phrases. Uh, so I just really enjoy speaking Spanish, especially because my boyfriend doesn't speak it. It just makes me more passionate about maintaining my tongue and if I ever have children teaching them Spanish and having that be their first language like it was mine. Um, it's been such a unique experience to be able to just communicate with people when I visit Mexico in my native tongue um, and just you know it's 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 unique. It's a different cultural um, experience speaking the language um, versus when you don't. I feel like um, just that's that's a very true um, representation of being a Latina to me is being able to understand the culture that my parents come from um, in a more holistic way, you know, by being able to speak with with people and, and especially my relatives in Mexico. So, did um, growing up, did your parents like tell you stories of like how different things were for them when they were growing up? You know. Not, not really. I feel like my parents were just so concentrated on helping us, you know, do the best that we could and, and helping us, you know, get to school and, and you know, get to bed on time, <laughs> just like very basic things. But I feel like as I got older, you know, um, I would ask questions here and there. And I've just, you know, come to, I've come to learn a lot about where my parents came from and just why they are the way they are, right? Because when we're children, we just don't understand sometimes. So it really takes us listening a little bit harder and trying to sympathize and understand our parents to, to understand their experiences and why they are the way they are. How different are the career paths that you and your siblings went? Oh, completely. <laughs> My older sister ended up doing um, child development, uh, so teaching, and now she's a director um, for... Uh, preschool uh, so that's pretty neat uh, because it's several preschools not just one it's like a company um, my brother is still going to college along with my sister so I'm really really proud of them what um, fields so my little sister is doing accounting um, so she's actually transferring over um, to a Cal State I'm not really sure which one um, but she works for affliction um, over in Seal Beach and she just really enjoys uh, the accounting aspect of things and all that. But again, she really wanted to do environmental studies. She's a very, you know, green thumb, loves the environment, which all, you know, I do too, but she really has um, a unique uh, drive for it. So I'm really proud of her that uh, she's still pursuing some degree, but I tell her all the time the way I tell everyone else, stick to your original plan. It's a passion for a reason. You can always do something else later. So we'll see what she ends up doing. <laughs> and your other sibling? My other sibling is still undeclared. He's, he's uh, the youngest. He's uh, the guy, the boy from our, our family. So I feel like just our parents cut slack, to, you know, uh, to my brother versus me and my sisters. But it might be a cultural thing. I'm not sure. <laughs> So what was your family's reactions when you were uh, when you made the decision of what degree and what, what career you wanted? You know, they were really supportive because I've always been like, this is what I want to do, this is how I'm going to do it, and they're just kind of like, aren't you working too hard? <laughs> and uh, 
and I'm like, what? You made me this way. <laughs> but I think when I ran, when I told them I wanted to run for city council in 2015, my parents were like, but you're so young, like, you know, you're gonna get stressed out, um, you know, are you sure? And I was just like, well, I'm gonna do it with, your, with, us, with or without your support. And um, I know my dad was like on board like the minute I said it. My mom was more like, you know, take it easy. <laughs> Um, because she understood that, you know, politics can be dirty and politics can be challenging and, and it sure has been. It's, I feel 10 years older in three years. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for people that maybe they'll have like uh, friends or family that are, I don't know, how, how do they describe it, like toxic or they're like, they're more like pessimistic towards like stuff that you want to do? Yeah, um, well, I would say you have to create boundaries with people that, people that are toxic but are still permanently in your lives, like your parents or your siblings or someone like that, you have to create boundaries because um, at least me being a Latina, I, don't, I didn't understand the boundaries. I was just like, oh, whatever my parents say, I just kind of have to take it in or whatever my siblings say, I just have to accept it. And it's like, no, no, we, we have the ability to tell people what our boundaries are and we can set those for ourselves even if people don't want to. Um, so, you know, I would recommend that if people have, you know, parents that say, you know, you cannot do this over my dead body, they create boundaries, which means either, you know, maybe they're now talking to a counselor instead of their parents about their career choices, or maybe they're talking to friends about something instead of um, their parents, or, you know, we all have to create um, an environment that's conducive to our own success, and everyone's success is different. And that's why, you know, I try to be sympathetic to people that I meet all the time because I don't know what circumstances have led them to their life choices. And, um, and we always need to be supportive of each other. It's like we only get one life. Um, all of us are here to do the best we can. And, and I always tell people, you know, surround yourself with people that want the best for you, that want you to succeed in the field that you want, not in the field that they want. Um, that want, you know, I, I have great friends that are always like, we hate politics, we don't understand it, we don't even know what you're talking about when you're talking about all these policies, but we support you. And whatever you need, we're here for you. Um, if you need us to walk precincts at your next election, we're here for you. And that's what it's all about. It's supporting each other's individualities and not trying to conform to something that, that we're not, you know? Everyone's different. Thank you everyone who's tuning in. I still see people coming in uh, throughout the year now and we're here on Periscope. Uh, going back to you know the people that are like maybe negative like when when you're trying to like achieve something um, I think the thing that I I sometimes hear is like um, why, do, why do I do what the things that I do like volunteer basis or why do I continue even just like maybe putting in time even to like radio when I'm not getting paid or anything right. like that mm -hmm. they don't understand the student stuff volunteer stuff that even volunteer things can like make a difference on a resume exactly so how, how like how do you deal with that or yeah um i just honestly um i think as i've gotten older i've i talk less and less to others about my unique goals because I, I do, you know, I always want to make sure that I'm keeping myself in a, in a good space, mentally, physically, emotionally. Um, so I'm going to say this, but like a lot of my projects that I have for city council, um, I am very careful in how I present them to my colleagues. I'm very strategic in who I tell about my projects or, or you know, who I'm having support my projects. Why? Because even though my perspective would be, I'm going to do this because it's going to benefit the kids, right? One of my colleagues could say, oh, she's just doing it because she wants to win over the kids because she probably wants something for herself in the future. So people have a weird way of twisting good intentions and um, hard work. Some people don't understand that. Like, how could it be that you're spending that much time in the radio volunteering? It just doesn't make any sense. Like, what do you really want, right? Everyone thinks there's an alternative motive for everything that we do um, that's good, healthy, and successful, right? Um, and it, I just think it's human nature, honestly. And 
I, and that's why I just, I'm very particular. Like um, in my condo, I have my office and I decorated everything in that office to something that I love, not something that nobody in, in, nobody that I know helped me decorate my office in any way. Um, so from the tapestry that I have hanging behind my desk to the computer that I picked out, um, to the colors and the lamps that I have, it's just like everything is all me because I need a space to unwind, uh, to regroup, and to think about my other goals, right? So it's just like as long as you're thinking about your next big project, or your next goal, it's like, this is all worth it. Volunteering is worth it. And we just have to like stick to it, right? <laughs> That's the hardest part. And some people just don't understand, which is okay. Um, we just have to be particular about who we share our successes with um, because not everyone, you know, wants to share it in your happiness and in your success, so. Uh, so much has happened since our last interview. Uh, tell us <laughs> any, any, anything, uh, any updates or stuff. Obviously you mentioned you, you have a new role uh, since then, tell us. Yeah, so um, my new role, I'm working for City of Long Beach. I'm assisting with running the elections. Uh, we just had the primary nominating election and uh, right now we're going through a runoff uh, for Council District 5 and 7 in Long Beach, along with Long Beach Unified School District uh, 3. So that's very exciting to be a part of that. Uh, we're working with the county to make sure that everything is perfect on Election Day and before. Um, so, you know, I'm doing my best to just be a good public servant um, because this is uh, the work that I do on a full-time basis, not, not City Council, but in the city of Long Beach, you know, that we're kind of the keepers of democracy. Um, you know, how we run an election and, you know, um, how transparent we are will dictate um, how people feel about um, the outcome of an election. You know, so it's really important to keep the public trust and just to do the best we can to achieve good results that are transparent. How tough is it to like go in and, and all of a sudden there's like, people that are like older and they're like they're not taking you serious because you're young right how is that yeah well, because like I remember you know like mm -hmm. um, when you were last on the show and you know I, I was trying to get involved also and stuff and trying to learn stuff and I remember um, like I was coming home from school and like uh, some car like had pulled like a gun on me and I was like oh oh, oh shoot gosh. and like uh, they, but then they were just giggling and they ended up going into the freeway and ever since then I was like oh how do I get involved or what's going on and and I found out about Block Watch in my city because I was like oh what can you do and they're like oh well there's there's commissions and I'm like oh okay and they're like oh yeah. but right now there's no spots so they're like there's Block Watch and I'm like oh okay so I signed up and everything and it turned out for for my city I had a like get a petition around in the, in the yeah. street and stuff throughout my block and get a certain percentage of uh, homes yeah. to fill it and I became the captain of that block. No way! And then, yeah, <laughs> so that was cool but then I went to actual block watch because I thought block watch was new and when I finally you know got went through the process and I had my first official meeting they turns out when you first become a captain they have the police come and to like have the blocks see you being presented as the official captain of your block. And then all of a sudden I get to the once a month meeting that we get to and I see, I'm like, why is it that Block Watch hasn't really been like promoted? So it's like, oh, it's word of mouth. Yeah. And I get there, it's mainly senior citizens. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, they've been so dedicated and stuff. But I, I faced like a lot of resistance at first because I remember asking straight out, I was like, so how come we're not on like Facebook and stuff? And they got so paranoid. They're like, no, um, we don't want no, our organization being mentioned. We're, we're going to end up, they're like, had this. I feel like, you. Oh my gosh. I feel you. Let me tell you something, okay? It took me three years. I, th this three years since I've been elected to get Wi Fi in our government buildings. Wow. We are a casino city. This is not a drill. Like, there is true resistance to innovation. And it's everywhere. It's in government. It's in, I mean, I feel like the private sector is always the one that's like cutting edge on the latest and greatest. But, you know, it's tough. People will resist change tooth and nail. So um, I just try my best, again, to be very careful in how I tippy toe uh, before I tell people, you know, this is, this is what I want to do or this is an idea. Let's digest it. And, 
I do it in bits and pieces. Sometimes I don't give too much information because it'll overwhelm people. And I suggest you do the same, you know, just little tidbits, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I was like. Baby steps. Ooh. I was like, all I, all I said was, how come we're not on Facebook? They're like, no, no, no. They literally, like, they gave this impression. That they, they don't want to tr uh, rush a probe, okay? Yeah, they figured <laughs> that they'd be like gangsters jumping out of bushes all of a sudden <laughs> if they had a Facebook page. It's, it's this big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. So I went from block watch to, to joining a park advisory, and then from there I got to serve at least one year term as a commissioner. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. On uh, the Parks and Rec Commission? No, they put me on uh, the Traffic Parking Public Safety Commission since I was there for a while. What city? Uh, from Linwood. Wow. And so I was there. That's a then, big deal. It's a big city. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I was I was so nervous and stuff because, you know, I was trying to, um, what, what, what did I do? I, I used to have a notebook with me. And I'd be, I didn't realize, like, how I'd be, like, like judged, like, the slightest thing, like, a resident would assume stuff, right? So like, I remember in one case, because that's another thing is I guess like sometimes residents will get like so excited, they'll go to commission and assume that we have like a ton of power. And uh, I remember this one lady uh, came and she was so upset about an ice cream truck no. being out at night and it, because she couldn't hear her novella. <laughs> and I was writing this down and she assumed that like she got, she approached me at the end of the meeting. She's like, how come you didn't say anything? about the ice cream truck and I remember um, um, like I, I really didn't know what to say other than you know I'm, I'm like I'm taking note of everything that you guys want to bring along to to you know what's going on and I'll bring it to the attention of my council member and stuff but I just felt like like a scapegoat or something or like being bullied like she let her on started picking on me on Facebook well, and stuff I'm too. I'm gonna tell you something a lot of people don't ever approach government buildings or government officials. And a lot of people don't know the difference between a commissioner and a council member, you know, and a mayor. A mm -hmm. lot of people, all they know is I went to that building, City Hall, I put in a, a complaint, and how come it's not addressed? That's all they know. So that's, you know, that's something that, you know, learning or, you know, being in the public administration field. Yeah. You know, we are very sensitive to the fact that, you know, citizens um, that participate in government for whatever reason, whether they're voting, um, whether they're showing up to one of our parks and recreation classes, or they're complaining about, you know, something related to traffic, you know, um, we're there to listen and just, you know, do the best we can, but it just takes a lot of education, you know, a lot of going out there, telling people, engaging people so that so that they know what avenues are available for their you know for their issues oh yeah this, this resident was super persistent i mean she wouldn't even take the time to bully me on social media i remember posting a picture that i was at the state of the city and right. she was so jealous i guess she didn't go she's all like saying oh lucky nancy and stuff like that <laughs> like just, wow you have a feisty uh <laughs> A feisty community, no. Yeah, <laughs> my I, residents I are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love my residents. <laughs> oh man, but um, yeah, um, just uh, afterwards, uh, I just you know I completed my term, and you know I'm like, oh, I'm gonna take a break, you know, right now. <laughs> Um, but that that was a, a whole unique experience, just to see what it's like to be on a commission and like. Uh, you know, for those that aren't familiar with what exactly a commission is and the difference uh, between like council and stuff, like yeah. So I mean, so what your experience is a lot like a lot of our you know commission. You know, in Hawaiian Gardens we have like a public safety commission, a planning commission, a parks and rec commission, um, and it's it's just so important for us uh, to engage our commissioners because sometimes. Okay they have great discussions and they've already kind of thought through all the possibilities for a certain project, right? So whenever a planning, a plan for a development comes to us, that means that it already went through planning commission. Um, so I always, you know, look at the planning commission's notes because they just really dwell and take the time to dissect um, everything having to do with the pros, the cons. Um, they probably thought of things I haven't even thought of. Um, so commissions are super useful in helping council members like myself make good decisions that have already been vetted 
So they're a great vetting process. Um, they have an extra set of eyes that I may not necessarily have, so. I think it froze. <laughs> this one froze the, um, the uh, periscope, but uh, <laughs> don't worry folks, we still got various other forms of video. But um, uh, yeah, another thing that I noticed too is the fact that you know, people have this assumption that senior citizens are like hermits, but in reality, like they're like the main ones that go to like meetings of cities and stuff. I was I was very impressed. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Our I know our senior population in Hawaiian Gardens is super active. Um, our senior programs are thriving, and so I'm always just in awe when I see just how involved everyone is. You know, they're the ones that tell me, you know. I saw something suspicious happening on this block, or I saw, you know, um, you know, trash that didn't get picked up. You know, any complaints, they're the first people to tell me because they're so vigilant and they have so much um, care and, and love for our community. Um, so I always just encourage everyone, you know, our senior citizens have been in Hawaiian Gardens for decades, upon decades. So I use them as role models and how I perceive my city, and I use the historical context that they grew up in to, you know, to be a better councilwoman. Yeah, I, I remember um, when I first joined Block Watch, there was this one senior who he stood out. He'd always, you know, be like, "How you doing, young man?" <laughs> he was like very energetic, and he'd yeah. be like, "I hope you had a great day." And he was always like really friendly and stuff, and you know, he'd always take the time to like greet me and stuff, and. Um, over time, I noticed that, like, because I, I didn't get to be a commissioner until, like, a year later when I first started to go to meetings and stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just, every month I'd go to these meetings of Block Watch where it's, you know, seniors, and I've seen, you know, the attendance slowly, like, diminish because of health. I've, since I've been there, like, I think, like, what, two passed away because of either, like, health issues or just old age. And uh, it, it was, you know, very emotional to see, you know, that, you know, he he came to the, the meeting and, you know, he's like, um, I'm here, you know, because I wanted to take the time to speak on orals and just say, you know, it was nice to have served along with you guys and, you know, due to health reasons, you know, like maybe I won't be able to keep doing this. And it was just really nice to like, you know, um, you know, all that they, you know, go and all the commitment that they've had and, you know, seniors help. Yeah. You know, wow. And that's, yeah, no, I I feel you. I mean, um, actually, I also, you know, I worked for the senior, the senior center in Hawaiian Gardens and I had a very similar experience. You know, I, I you know, worked with people that, you know, ended up passing away as well. And honestly, I, I was, Kind of traumatized because I remember thinking like I can't I can't work <laughs> I can't work here because you know this specific program just because how deeply it affected me um, you know my parents when they moved here they left their parents in Mexico you know so we would visit but when my grandparents passed away um, it wasn't the same level of attachment as someone who has daily contact right so I was never prepared for, you know, our senior citizens, you know, slowly passing away. And it just, again, that's a population that is going through so much. I mean, a lot of them do not have financial security. A lot of them do not have means to support themselves 100%. So as, you know, community members, just I completely appreciate what you're doing in your community because you're giving them not only a place where they can socialize because you know a lot of them may not have children that live with them they may be alone um, but also an opportunity to care about their community and be of service and that's one thing that I'll never forget is you know our senior citizens are a part of our community just like anyone else and you know um, I'm always so glad when I see them participate in our meetings and just show up to our events because they are so important to our communities and I just want everyone to always feel welcomed and, and a part of it even if you know whatever their situation is at home they know that you know when they come to our, our facilities they're going to be taken care of um, and we're going to hear them out because they vote <laughs> that's one thing I know is our senior citizens vote they're the most um, consistent voting block for sure so of course we have to pay attention to their needs and 
I'm just glad that you're having these experiences because gerontology is a, a growing, huge growing um, field, right? We have all these baby boomers that are, you know, retiring quickly and at a rate that we can't keep up, right? So it's like how we're going to deal with our senior citizens and, and help making sure that they stay housed and clothed and fed is going to be a challenge of our lifetime. Well, another question I ask my guests is, you know, um, where do you see yourself after retirement and what would you like your legacy to be? After retirement? I'm only 30! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get through my work day. <laughs> so, um, what am I, you know, my legacy? I'm a fixer, right? And uh, people always ask me, Myra, you know, are you planning to run for second, third term? Are, are you going to seek higher office after the city of Hawaiian Gardens, you know, city council position? And my response is always like, no, you know, I'm a fixer. I have a list. I have my eyes on the prize. I know exactly what I want to fix in my city. I know what I want to improve in my city. I know the projects that I want to tackle in my city. Um, and there are so many cities and places that need assistance, um, way more than Hawaiian Gardens, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm the kind of person that I'm in, I clean it up, and I'm out right? I lived in Hawaiian Gardens my whole life. Um, so my goal is just to complete the, the, you know, all my goals that I have for my city. Um, you know, hopefully great people get elected this November uh, to, you know, to fil flip the council and make it just like a very solid council that really cares about the community um, and has a similar vision as I do um, so that I can move on to other projects. Uh, ultimately, I want to just, like, I guess I want my legacy to be, you know, that I cared and I did something. Um, a lot of us always leave it up to someone else to step up and you know um, the buck stops with me, right? If I see something, if I see injustice, if I see something that that isn't right, I'm, I'm always going to speak up. So I want people to always know that that I, I stood up for them. I stood up for what was right um, and whether it's in Hawaiian Gardens or in a different field altogether, a nonprofit, foundation, I don't know. I just know that that um, there's a lot of need in our city. Uh, there's a lot of need in LA County. Our homeless people, um, you know, are in dire need. So I'm just trying to get through through this year and, and just try and assess how I can better utilize all my skills. But I appreciate that question. <laughs> um, how can people contact? Yeah, so people actually can follow me. Um, again, my name is Myra Maravilla, and they can follow me on Instagram, M-Y-R-A-M-A-R-L-U. And um, they can also send me an email. You know, I have all my contact information on my Instagram. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Maravilla, M-A-R-A-V-I-L-L-A, and then Myra, M-Y-R-A. Um, so just say I always encourage people follow me probably the easiest way honestly is just send me a direct message on Instagram because that's probably like the easiest outlet for me <laughs> um, and so yeah I'm quick to respond and people have ideas shoot them you know my way and hopefully we can get get things done cool. well I want to thank you for taking the time to be here on the golden spotlight thank you for having me Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes this episode. Until next time, folks. <laughs>